Today I'm in Bowling Green, Kentucky, home of Western Kentucky University and the museum that showcased America's sports car since 1994, the National Corvette Museum. It sits on the west side of I-65 at exit 28 and features over 70 amazing Corvettes and a few with a couple of dings that I'll be looking at a little later. Anyway, you can really feel the excitement as you drive past the building. If you're in a big truck or have a larger RV, come in gate A and follow the signs and you don't have to worry, there's plenty of parking out back. Once you get situated, it's just a short walk to the entrance. Check out that 63C2 in the window. I was pleasantly surprised to find out it was only $10 to tour the museum. But you can actually go in and see some of the cars in the lobby, visit the gift shop and eat at the Corvette Cafe without paying the admission fee. The lobby, better known as Corvette Boulevard, looked like a showroom loaded with the latest model Corvettes. After a short struggle that I'm sure entertained a few bystanders, I managed to get the door open and try one on for size. The interior was stylish and very high tech, but a little snug for big boned people. It was a bit of a struggle to get out, bad for me anyway. There's a driving simulator that for a $10 fee allows guests of all ages to get behind the wheel of a real C6R and drive around a virtual racetrack. The only stipulation, you have to be able to reach the pedals. You can also bring along a passenger if you can find somebody brave enough. The Corvette was the brainchild of this man, automotive designer and business executive Harley Earl. The first 300 C1 Corvettes rolled off the line in 1953 in Flint, Michigan, moving to St. Louis in 1954. The tour took me on a trip through the history of the Corvette, featuring models on display from just about every year, many of the cars on loan from private owners. There was a full-sized late 50s service station, a Corvette dealer showroom, and a life-size diorama of the mid-70s assembly line body drop section of the plant. Think of Corvette, you automatically think of racing. The museum had a small section devoted to racing. One car that really stood out to me was the 1976 Spirit of Le Mans 76 car with its 600 cubic inch engine putting out around 700 horsepower it was capable of going 225 miles an hour amazing numbers for that year The tour touched on research and development over the years with clay models as well as some small and life-size prototypes. There was an example of a hydroformed chassis, a process that utilizes oil under pressure to force metal sheets into dyes. It creates unblemished, cleaner, stronger components and therefore a safer platform. And then there was a heartbreaking crash test car. What a waste.
While the Sky Dome was the site of one of the greatest disasters in the history of the Corvette, it serves a double purpose. It houses some really rare and unique Corvettes from throughout the history of the brand, including the one millionth Corvette. During this visit, I got my picture taken in the Sky Dome. I had visited a few weeks earlier and had a picture taken near the entrance to the museum. A construction project to force the photographer to move. I was happy to discover that my home state of Michigan had the highest density of Corvette owners in the country with 3.47 Corvettes per 1,000 residents. 82% of Corvette owners are between the age of 40 and 69. Corvettes were used as pace cars at the Indianapolis 500 15 times in varying designs. There were several examples represented in the Sky Dome, including one of the most popular and recognizable, the black and silver 25th anniversary 1978 L82. I mentioned that the Sky Dome has two purposes. Well, what else does it do? Its bright yellow color and unique shape draws the eye of passers-by traveling on I-65. One look and you realize that there's something there that needs to be investigated. The rarest Corvette known to exist is this 1983 C4. Only 43 were produced that year. All of them were pre-production models that were used for engineering evaluations and crash tests, then destroyed, with the exception of this one. So if anyone tries to sell you an 83, tell them you've already got one. On February 12, 2014, at 5.38 a.m., the roof of a previously undiscovered cave 80 feet below the Sky Dome became unstable and collapsed, causing a sinkhole 65 feet by 45 feet by 25 to 30 feet deep. It quickly swallowed eight rare and one-of-a-kind Corvettes. Large concrete floor slabs and dirt fell in along with the cars, causing irreparable damage to some of them. There are many security camera videos of the actual collapse available on YouTube. At the end of the tour, everything took a turn, and I entered a room that paid homage more to the history of racing than to the Corvette. With some really great exhibits, some historic race cars, it was a look into the past and the dangers faced by the brave men who paved the way during the early development of racing. I also picked up the pictures that I posed for at the beginning of the tour. What do you think? Oh yeah, I'd take any of these. 
Corvette store was really cool with hundreds of great t-shirts, coffee cups, and just about anything Corvette you could want. I grabbed a shirt, a coffee cup, and a Corvette replica owner's manual for 1960, the year I was born. After a walk through the gift shop, I was feeling a little hungry, so I headed over to the Corvette Cafe, a retro 50s diner from Anywhere USA. I had a garden salad and a loaded Chevy burger with a soda. It was a great way to end a great day at the National Corvette Museum. Will I be back? You know it, and I hope I see you there.